Um, so yeah, so my, my name is Mike Savilla, and uh, I'm from Ohio. Um, and when I landed here yesterday uh, to this 90 degree weather, I was like, wow, this is kind of really cool. I should maybe live here, because uh, it's 30 degrees colder at home. Uh, so, uh, but uh, I want to thank the planning committee for the invitation to come out. Uh, I always love talking about uh, this uh, topic of digital communication and social media. So I don't come around these parts that much. Um, so this picture, I don't know if we can darken the room a little bit. Uh, this is me uh, 40 years ago um, at Disneyland, uh, which is the last time I came around here. Uh, and uh, so kind of my parents' story, uh, my parents came from the Philippines uh, and my dad uh, trained uh, at a surgery program in Youngstown, Ohio. And back in the late 60s, early 70s, there was a huge Filipino community uh, there back then. Uh, and uh, that's where I was born, that's where I grew up, that's where I practice now. So this is my practice. Um, as I said in the last session, um, we have a big group practice in northeastern Ohio. We have six family docs, we have a nurse practitioner, we have a physician's assistant, we have a lab in our office, um, and the hospital is right across the street from uh, the office. We see patients in the hospital. Uh, we see our newborn babies. Uh, we see patients in the intensive care unit. Uh, we go to the nursing home. Um, very traditional primary care family medicine practice. The practice has been there for about 45, 50 years. Um, and it's been great um, you know, working there. And uh, you know, when I first started medical school, this is really, really what I wanted to do. And uh, it's really a dream come true to, to come back and do that. So this is uh, my website, uh, drmikesvilla.com, and kind of my uh, social media and uh, digital communication story started about 10 years ago. Uh, I started uh, as an anonymous blogger uh, back in 2005 and 2006 and 2007. The culture back then uh, in the physician social media community was to be anonymous. And they had bloggers back then with names like Grunt Doc and Panda Bear, uh, people that I got to know uh, pretty well. So when I started my social media life, I, I, I tried to come up with a really kind of you know, buzzy type name. And I went to Google, and I went to Blogger, uh, and I found out that Dr. Anonymous was not taken. So about 10 years ago in 2006, I started blogging as Dr. Anonymous. Now, what did I talk about back then? Um, what I talked about is, I talked about the frustrations of taking care of patients in this broken healthcare system. I talked about non-compliant patients. I talked about how it was to deal with insurance companies, to deal with pre-authorizations, all that type of stuff. A lot of venting was happening because that was the culture back then in social media and medicine. Uh, and I start to felt the, the power of social media when I started getting you know, comments and feedback from people outside of the United States. Uh, I remember getting a blog comment from somebody in Europe and somebody in Asia, and they said, oh, we really like what you're, what you're talking about. You should, keep, you should keep telling your story. And that's when I really started to figure out, you know, you know physicians, People in healthcare really need to start telling this story. Um, but a few years later, uh, there were physician bloggers, there were those in, in the medical community who started getting outed. Um, the most uh, notorious one was a pediatric uh, physician uh, who was blogging during his malpractice trial. Uh, which was really uh, entertaining reading, let me tell you. Uh, he was making fun of the plaintiff and all this other kind of stuff, but what happened was uh, that the other side found out that he was this anonymous blogger named Dr. Flea, uh, and uh, kind of in this television moment, they said, are you Dr. Flea? And they said yes, and then uh, the, the case was settled the next day. So, so I don't talk, right now, you know, I don't talk about patients, I don't talk about any kind of clinical care. What I talk about now was, you know, I talk about, health policy, I'll talk about things in the news, uh, commentary, that type of thing. Uh, I'm also on Twitter, as, as Dr. Lee also uh, stated before. 
Um, so, uh, so feel free to tweet and make fun of me during this presentation. I won't, need, I won't get to see it until afterward. Um, so, but it, it's cool, um, you know, having 21,000 followers because it really shows that you have a voice um, to say what you really need to say about whatever you're really passionate about. Um, and I've gotten a lot of cool opportunities uh, from that. Uh, this was five years ago. Uh, this was the, the cover of Medical Economics magazine. Uh, and they reached out to me and, and uh, they asked a question which all of you are going to deal with or maybe have dealt with already. Do you friend your patients on Facebook or will you friend your patients on Facebook? Uh, and back, you know, even five years ago, that was a big, big, big question, not just for physicians, but for physical therapists and for nurses and for other type of thing, because that's something that we never really had to deal with before. So what, what I tell people is that, uh, you know, I'm not absolute yes or no. You know, uh, physicians and patients have been friends for a long time, even before the Internet. So I'm very selective on kind of who I friend on social media. Uh, and I live in a small town, you know, everybody knows everybody else. When I go to Walmart or when I go to the store, people stop me and say, hey doc, my kid's got this rash, you know. <laughs> what are you gonna do, say no? Uh, so you really kind of have to learn how to manage your digital footprint uh, when it comes to some of this stuff. Um, I've gotten to do some commentary. This is Medscape. Um, I did commentary earlier uh, this year on why I think um, physicians uh, should be on social media. I'll get to that in a little bit as well. And I've gotten to do some, do some fun stuff too. Um, this is uh, up at Stanford. Uh, if people are familiar with the Stanford Medicine Next conference is going on this very weekend. Uh, if you want to know what patients are doing on social media, this is where you go. They are live video streaming their conference. It, they are patients, very, very, very savvy patients. You're gonna hear the term e-patient if you haven't already. These are patients who are very motivated. These are patients who bring in their own research studies that they have found on cancer or whatever, and they're gonna ask you, what do you think about this treatment regimen? And so that's why you have to know about a lot of these things because you know, patients are also very motivated to tell their story um, on social media to find treatment uh, and to talk to you about it. So I, I really, really want to emphasize, you know, I, I do not use social media to communicate with my patients. Um, you know, I don't tweet, you know, any kind of treatment um, or I don't use social media. Um, I don't use social media for any kind of clinical care. Um, I don't advocate for any of you guys to do that unless it's kind of password protected, um, you know, that type of thing. A lot of big hospital symptoms, we don't have it in, in our type, our part of the, the country, but there's a lot of bigger systems that have password protected email and that type of thing, and, and that is permitted. But in general, I don't use any kind of digital communication to, to uh, uh, talk with patients. But I uh, want to talk about, for, for the majority of this talk, and I realize this is the last talk before you go to lunch, so I definitely understand that. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how I use social media for advocacy and to share, uh, share, my, share our story, uh, story of physicians, of primary care of physicians. Now, why am I talking about social media? So I'm talking about social media because our patients are using social media. Every single day in my office, I have patients bringing me information um, from the internet, and they're going to ask you about that. Um, I've been doing uh, social media literacy for physicians for about seven or eight years now. Uh, and when I go to physician groups, when I started talking to them about it, they're like, I don't talk to patients about what they, stuff that they bring out on the internet. Um, but it's, it's, patients are pushing us more and more to utilize this stuff. So that's why you all have to kind of know that. 71% um, of all U.S. adults uh, greater than 18 use Facebook. That's 936 million active users. 56% um, adults 65 and over use Facebook. Um, a lot of docs are like, what? Um, but I mean, the older generations are using social media as well. So I'm gonna uh, do some case studies on advocacy. Uh, on how social media has been used very, very effectively. 
Um, obviously, a lot of this is, is, uh, is news-driven. I, uh, I prepared this last week. Obviously, this week has all been about the Pope. Um, but last week, you know, people probably heard of this story, okay? This is, uh, how many people have seen this video? So people who haven't seen this video, so this was uh, the Miss America pageant. That's Miss Colorado who came out and did a, what I call, what I thought was kind of a, a little mini TED Talk, if you've heard of those. Uh, she did two minutes on why she's very passionate about nursing. Um, and the, the next day, um, you may have heard in the news that The View came on and basically just made fun of her. Uh, which started to obviously get nurses and a lot of people in healthcare very, very upset. So they started using the, the Twitter hashtag Nurses Unite. Uh, to try to you know, get their story out and to say, hey, this was really wrong what happened. And this was over the course of just a few days. The next day, you know, The View kind of had a pseudo type of apology, which nobody really liked at all, but that meant that the nursing community and everybody kept going with the Nurses United hashtag to say, hey, you know, you, you called it a doctor's stethoscope. It's not really a doctor's stethoscope. You know, nurses use stethoscopes as well, and you may have seen you know, either on Twitter or, or, or on Facebook a lot of, a lot of uh, medical professionals, not only nurses, but also other health professionals wear their stethoscope in solidarity with them and to, uh, to show their support for nurses and, you know, against these people. So then things started really getting interesting. This is only 24 or 48 hours afterward. You saw the impact of this advocacy movement that just started one or two days before that. You saw some of the sponsors from that TV show, The View, start to drop off. Um, and as of now, I think it's about a dozen of those sponsors really hitting that show very hard in the pocketbook uh, with their sponsorship. So this is something that you can use social media for is to get that story out there because even though they had millions of people on television, you know, the nursing community and those who supported them had the internet and the social media community with them and this is kind of what happened. Uh, and of course, you know, I can't, I can't talk about Dr. Oz with, with, uh, <laughs> without mentioning this. So he kind of capitalized on the situation as well. He had nurses on their show, on his show, to show his support, which I thought it was very, from a public relations standpoint, very savvy. Uh, so at this point, you know, um, it, it's off the front page, um, but you're going to keep hearing stories like this. And before social media, I mean, this would have never happened. Somebody on a TV show would have said something and then nobody would have had said anything else about it. So that's kind of one of the powerful things about social media that, that you can use uh, for advocacy efforts. So the, the second case study, which actually happened in the same week um, as, the, as the View show, uh, was immunizations. And, uh, people may, may have uh, seen this. It, it was the Republican debate, um, and uh, these two gentlemen uh, talked about immunizations and how they really thought uh, that vaccines uh, cause <laughs> autism. Uh, so a, a little bit of a, 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 of a, a tangent on that. I mean, um, you know, back, you know, when I was in medical school, that's when the study came out. That's when the false study came out that the MMR vaccine caused autism. And what happened back then? What happened back then was that those on Google, those on the internet, those on social media, used that to spread their message. Uh, organized medicine, did not have any kind of response to that back then. You saw people like celebrities like Jenny McCarthy going on the Oprah Winfrey show and people listening to her. Uh, and even to this day, I still have parents who come into my office and say, Dr. Savilla, you know, I think you know, that MMR vaccines cause autism. I don't want to give that to my child. You know, and you saw that right here in California uh, at the beginning of this year. 
you know, uh, with, the, with the Disneyland thing, you know, which just, and I had people in my office talk to me about that. So this was flared up last week again with this uh, falsely uh, driven narrative. So, so what I tried to do, you know, is I got, I got my flu shot that week, okay, and a lot of my friends and colleagues, you know, tried to counteract that because now we are prepared to respond to that, okay? There wasn't any kind of hashtag. There was all kinds of hashtags. It wasn't one that really came together, but a lot of people that week showed their support to try to spread the correct information that vaccines do not cause autism. Now, the interesting thing that came about with that, because I wrote a blog post about that and I had my picture up there, and you can see here uh, that the anti-vaccine movement is still very strong out there. Um, they went after me, they went out of, after a lot of my colleagues. You know, how about you, know, you take the Offit Challenge, which I still don't know what that is. Uh, Dr. Offit is, is a, a vaccine proponent, but it also says, uh, you know, don't post a picture of, of taking a, a fake vaccination. Uh, and there was a lot of worse tweets um, like these uh, that came on, you know, that same day. And what I wanted to illustrate with this is that there are people out there, you know, who are still believing this. There are still people out there that are scaremongers, that are people out there who want to spread false information about not only vaccines, but also about other things. And I think it's your, your responsibility to kind of, you know, not only call that out, but to tell the story, you know, of what truly happens in medicine, what the facts are, what the research is. Because if you don't do it, then you're gonna let the other people tell their story. And you're gonna have people in your office ask you about vaccines causing autism. So it's really, really important for all of you to recognize that there are forces out there that are still out there that are telling this story um, and you have to be aware and try to combat that in the best way you can. People, did people see this at the beginning of this year? This was uh, Jimmy Kimmel talking about uh, anti-vaccine. If you haven't, uh, watch this on YouTube. Um, and and it, they, he has, what, what he said was real doctors on there and they're using colorful language and he bleeped it out. Uh, and it was pretty funny stuff. So uh, this is kind of, um, you know, the, the, the mainstream media uh, coming behind vaccines. And this was all during that Disneyland outbreak um, as far as, uh, uh, and being anti-vaccine, and, and Dr. Lee also talked about the legislation that, that happened here in California as well as far as uh, religious exemptions from vaccines. Um, and, and I also talked about um, uh, vaccines and autism and, and the need to tell the truth. I, I did a, a, a little uh, TED talk in my local community in Youngstown, Ohio, uh, talking about that kind of to make an effort uh, to say, hey, this is what's really happening. This is what the truth is. Um, so the next case study um, is from my friends uh, at Primary Care Progress. Are, are people familiar with Primary Care Progress at all? They're, they're a, a great primary care advocate. They are at many medical schools. They are at many uh, universities um, out there to tell the story that primary care uh, is very much needed. We need more primary care providers. We need more primary care physicians. Um, and what they did um, a few years ago, using social media, was to have an advocacy campaign around National Primary Care Week, uh, which I think is probably coming up. I think it's in October uh, every year sometime. Um, and I think AMSA is really driving that every year as well. So what they did in, in 2012 is they had something very simple. They had uh, this kind of uh, picture. They had this uh, eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and all they had was primary care is blank. And what they had people do is they had people fill in what they think they're very passionate about primary care. And they had all of these people, uh, medical students, they went to their chapters and they said, hey, you know, tell the story of primary care. Why are you passionate about it? Probably the most powerful um, image was this one, okay? So this is something that you can use that's very simple. You can use this for social media advocacy. 
It's very low buy-in. It's not like you have to write a blog post or record a podcast or do any kind of YouTube video. This is something very simple. Something very simple that you can do with your friends, your colleagues, your patients. You know, a photo campaign like this to tell a story, whatever story that you want to do. Um, and it was great working with them on this project. Um, and and if, you, if you don't know Primary Care Progress and, and you're interested in primary care, definitely go check them out. Um, so the next uh, brief case study, these, these get shorter as, as they go along. So um, something that's popped up in the past six months, anybody who are budding surgeons out there, I encourage you to go out to Twitter and, and church out this hashtag, I look like a surgeon, okay? And it's cool because they have, a, you know, these people who are using social media, you know, they, they take pictures when they're in the operating room, they take pictures with their families. What they're trying to do is, is to overcome stereotypes uh, in the general community when it comes to when people think of surgeons. Uh, and they've really kind of gained steam in the past probably four to six months. Uh, they've been to national physician meetings, they've been to medical student meetings, um, and they are out there really trying to come together in a community, like Dr. Lee was talking about earlier today, you know, a community to tell your story, to be advocates. And of course, uh, we talked about that, Dr. Lee talked about this before, you know, as far as, you know, family medicine revolution, uh, there are people in our community who um, are very passionate um, about family medicine, passionate about uh, primary care. Um, some of them are tech savvy as well. We use Twitter, we use Facebook, we use Instagram. Um, because, you know, we, there's still a lot of uh, people across the country that don't know what a family physician is. They don't know what a primary care physician is, uh, which is astonishing to me. But it, it means to me that we need to tell our story better. Uh, we have to say, hey, you know, we're just not somebody who refers you to a specialist. You know, we have some, we're, we are people who you know, generate relationships with you. Um, you know, I had a, 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 a visit this week with three generations in one room. Um, and those are kind of the things that I love telling as far as why am I a primary care physician? Why am I a family physician? So, um, so those are things that you can, you can tell uh, using social media. Um, so this is uh, uh, my next to last slide, um, and this is my friend uh, Brian Verdebedian. He's uh, uh, he's kind of a social media uh, futurist. He's a social media leader. Um, he is a uh, pediatric gastroenterologist in Houston at Texas Children's Hospital, uh, and he wrote this probably about nine or ten years ago. And, and he said that uh, you know physicians have an obligation to share what they know on social media. Uh, and why did he say that? Because there are a lot of bad information out there. There's a lot of information out there that uh, are telling the wrong story. Um, and it's us as you know, physicians, as physicians in training, to really kind of say, hey, you know, this is how it really is, or this is what I'm really passionate about. Um, I have friends who, you know, who uh, write, you know, Twitter entries or Facebook or on all kinds of things that they're passionate about, whether it's social justice issues, whether it's gun control, whether it's uh, NRA issues, whether it's women's health issues, whether it's health policy issues. Um, the only way that we can you know, reach people, whether they're the general public, all the way to the state house, all the way to Washington, D.C., uh, is, is to tell our story. Because if we let other people tell our story, it's the wrong story. And that's something that I'm very passionate about talking about digital communication, talking about social media uh, to people is that, you know, we really have to tell our story. What, is, what, are your, what are you really passionate about? And you find a group of people either in person or out there on the internet. That's the beauty of the internet. I mean, I, I have people who I talk with all around the world about primary care and family medicine issues. We are more similar than we are different. Um, and this is a great tool for us to kind of come together and to tell our story. So this is uh, my information here. You know, um, I know it's been a, a very long morning. I appreciate your attention. I, I appreciate you coming and checking out my talk right before lunch. 
Um, I'm happy to, to answer any questions. We do have a few minutes before, uh, before lunch, so uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so the, the question is, how do I keep up with information? Uh, and uh, all of you have probably have tried to figure out how you're going to do that. Uh, one of the cool things about social media is that, um, especially on Twitter, um, I follow a lot of really smart people. Um, and those are the people that kind of filter out the information uh, for me. That's one of the strengths of social media. So I know when the national you know, cardiology convention is. I know when the national oncology convention is or the radiology convention is because they share that on their social media feeds. And I can kind of see, hey, this is what is going to be coming out. This is what they're going to be talking about six months from now. Uh, so that's one of the ways that, that I try to do that. Um, a lot of the national organi organizations now, whether the medical organizations, they also use social media as well. Um, so you definitely need a filter out there uh, to say, hey, this is what the real information is and this is what, what it's not. I really use social media to try to, try to filter that information and, and to try to keep up with things. Yes? Um, thank you again for sharing your thoughts with us. I have two questions. Sure. Um, Second is, um, I personally have an interest in writing, I'm sure others do in this room as well, and um, practically what advice would you have to um, get for which forms and media, uh, mediums for us to get the most traction in getting people to read pieces? Wow, those are great questions. Um, um, I mean, the, the first question is, you know, what, you know what, why is the, the medical student voice important? I mean, why is it not? I mean, it, you know, all of you are the, are the future of medicine, and, and I look to all of you to kind of guide me and, and saying, you know, what, what is important to you? What, what is uh, important from your point of view, your unique point of view? Because even when I was in training, a lot of the issues are different. Um, so we definitely need the voice of the medical student or even, even an undergraduate to, to tell your story about what you're really uh, passionate about, what you're really, what's really important to you. Um, how to get started? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, well, what I usually tell people is um, you know, um, have people start out with what are you comfortable with? Um, if people are comfortable with more kind of long form writing, you know, you can go to a lot of free type blogging sites, you know, like WordPress or Blogger or something like that um, to start out with. Um, you know, um, even Twitter is kind of a micro type blog. Um, so those are ways that you can, you can start to um, share your thoughts that way. Um, when it comes to Twitter and that type of things, it's, at least from when I uh, talk to my colleagues, um, when I go to conferences, um, that's when I usually get people uh, at least curious and interested about social media. They're like, oh, well, what are you doing there? Well, I'm taking notes on this, um, on this lecture. Um, and I use it um, using Twitter uh, because I, I can go back and look at it, but I'm able to share with that as well. Um, but, you know, some people are comfortable, you know, with, you know, one or two minute YouTube videos about patient education or that type of thing. So it's whatever your comfort level is. Some of it's writing, some of it's video. That's what's great about social media. It is so diverse. Um, and don't be afraid to try and fail. I, I've tried and failed at every single platform out there. Um, but I've found what I've interested in and that's what I've kind of focused on. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Yeah. But sometimes the actions get lost. Uh, how, do you, how do you translate from being uh, in conversations into an action? Does someone usually take charge of this, or do you just wait until it gets noticed? Um, not sure what you're asking. So like, how do you translate? So for example, the ones you just talked about, uh, the family, med family medicine yeah. thing. So is it the point is just to get a conversation started, or do you, do you foresee any action from that? Uh, yeah, so, so, so there's a message, yeah. 
and then what's the action after that? Is that kind of what you're asking? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question too. So, so some people just, just want to you know, get a message out um, and saying, hey, I'm passionate about this. Um, but what I found a really effective people doing is, is making a call to action to something. You know, whether it's passing this bill or having more funding or um, getting more people uh, interested or aware of the issue that you're talking about. So, uh, so there isn't really a, a person that kind of controls all of that. Uh, if you start to get noticed, then you probably get noticed by more of the national people who uh, may even retweet your blog post or that type of thing, which is obviously very cool. Um, but when it gets out there, yeah, there, there really isn't any kind of control. And the best thing you can do is, is you know, when you do produce that uh, piece of content, you know, whether it's a blog post or a video or a Vine video or something like that, is, is, to, is to make it um, very clear on one, what the message is, and two, what the action item is. And if you're able to do that, then when it does go viral, people will know exactly uh, what, the, what your message is and what you're asking of them. I know everybody's ready for lunch. <laughs> yes? Do you have any advice on choosing a specific uh, tag or choosing a specific hashtag, uh, like a name or a hashtag that would have the most impact? Yeah, I, I, for, as far as uh, choosing hashtags, uh, obviously the first thing is a search and make sure that it's not uh, already being used. Uh, when we came up with FM Revolution, we, all, we almost came up with FMR. Um, which if you Google that, that's not a very good thing that comes up. Uh, so uh, uh, so uh, one, make sure that you, um, make sure it's not used. Another, another tip that I have for people is there's, a, there's a, a website, at least for medical type of hashtags, it's called Simpler, S-Y-M-P-U-L-R dot com. And those are people who are focused on healthcare related hashtags. So if you go there and you put in something like hashtag MedX that is focused on the Stanford Medicine X conference and you can kind of see the uh, data that is being produced there. Just yesterday the MedX conference produced 15,000 tweets from one day of a conference which is like unheard of. Uh, but in general other types of uh, advice for hashtags is to make them short um, hopefully, you know, four or five characters because uh, the longer your hashtag, the less message that you have, at least on a Twitter post. Um, and try to make it you know, easier for people to kind of relate to. If it's a conference, I usually recommend people have a number associated with that um, and not a lot of abbreviations. So hopefully that's helpful. Uh, maybe we can do one more question and then I can. I can let you guys go. Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, yeah go ahead. I, I, um, one of the, you know, the motivating factors to, I guess, at least in the blogging world, to keep on blogging is that you have a readership and traffic to your blog. Yeah. Um, but how do you initially, when someone starts blogging, how do you um, make sure that you have uh, enough traffic? Do you have any tips on that? Yeah, so traffic to your blog, um, yeah, there, there, there's a, um, there's kind of a whole thing as far as uh, uh, SEO or optimization of that type of thing. Um, there's a whole kind of science or pseudoscience uh, behind that. Uh, but when I uh, uh, recommend people get started, I recommend people you know, start a website or um, you know, a blog post kind of as your home base. And that's kind of where you have all of your contact information, all of your blog posts. Uh, and when you do post stuff on Twitter, um, or on Facebook, and then you put a link in there back to your website. And that kind of drives people back there to the one place where people can, can contact you. Um, and you know, when you're you know, talking to people about it, uh, rather than saying, you know, I'm on Twitter and YouTube and Facebook, um, just say, you know, see like you know, drmikesfellow.com. And that gives people access to all of your type of information. Um, and, and I guess in closing, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, I have really used um, social media as a marketing tool for my practice. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. We talked about how to um, get more patients to your practice. 
Um, I've had lots of patients say, Dr. Sevilla, I am here seeing you because I Googled Salem, Ohio in primary care or family medicine. We saw your YouTube videos. We saw your um, interviews on local television. We saw what you think about vaccines and that's why I'm here. Um, and as all of you start you know, this journey, you know, really kind of Google your name and see what is your digital footprint out there. You know, and does it have the information that you want people to know about you, especially people who could potentially hire you, residency programs? Because I have a lot of, you know, my colleagues who are in residency programs and, um, and who are recruiting, you know, they have the application, but the first thing they do now is they Google your name, you know? And if they have those, you know, pictures from spring break back in college, um, they still could really affect you. Uh, so really kind of see what your own digital footprint is out there. Uh, and, and I guess the other the thing too is that I have a lot of medical students, you know, ask me, they say, well, Dr. Sevilla, you know, you know, do I have to ask, you know, my school or my residency program uh, to do this? Uh, and generally I would say no, you know. I mean, we do have this culture of permission, asking permission. Uh, to do this, and, and uh, that's why I have a lot of medical students and residents very, very hesitant to dip into social media because they think they have to ask somebody about it. Uh, residency programs and medical schools and even hospitals now are really kind of seeing the, the positive power of social media, and they're going to need people like you to help you know, market their hospital, market their practice, market their residency program. You're gonna see, you know, if you haven't already, you know, residency programs are on Facebook, they are on Twitter, they are on uh, Instagram. Uh, and you know, they're really kind of seeing things turn the tide there. So, so if, you're, if you're anxious about it at all, um, you know, just ask yourself, what are you gonna talk about? You know? um, and if, stuff, if it's stuff that you're really passionate about, um, then you know, maybe you, know, you don't wanna work for that program that doesn't wanna hire you, you know, because this is you, this is a part of you. Um, so, if you have questions, you know, please feel, feel free to reach out and, and talk to me about it. I have made every single mistake in social media, uh, and I'm still around, I'm still working, I'm still at the same job, um, but it, it's been fun for me uh, to kind of, you know, share my story, share the story of family medicine, share the story um, uh, of, you know, our profession. Um, and I think it's very important. So, but if you have further questions, feel free to come up. I appreciate your attention. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.